Uh, thanks everyone for showing up and uh, a special thank you, of course, to Felicia Katz Harris and Leslie Fagri and Don Kaufman at the Museum of International Folk Art for inviting me today and for hosting this. Uh, it's really great to be here and, and I look forward to talking to you guys about yokai. So uh, before we get into cataloging yokai, I think it's helpful to start with some definitions. Uh, this might be someone's first time hearing the word, or you might be familiar with the word, but hard to pin down an actual definition of yokai. So I'd like to talk about that first. There's a lot of ways to define yokai. Um, so this is just my definition, but you don't have to take this as, as the only definition there is out there. Uh, so let's start with the meaning of the word itself. Uh, yokai is made up of two characters, yo and kai. Yo means attractive, bewitching, and calamity. So there's a hint of danger to it. Well, kai means something mysterious or wondrous. The definition that I use for yokai is supernatural creatures and phenomena from Japanese folklore. And what I mean by that, creatures and phenomena means that this covers the entire realm of the supernatural. It's not just ghosts and monsters. It includes things like lights, sounds, feelings, magic, etc. Japanese means it's specific to Japan. We've already got a word for monsters from Western folklore. That word is monsters. So there's no sense in making yokai apply to everything around the world. In my definition, yokai is specifically with regards to Japanese folklore. And finally, by the word folklore, I mean it's not owned by anybody, or rather it's owned by everybody. Uh, so no copyright characters count as yokai. There's a lot of creatures that seem like yokai, um, you know, Pokemon, Godzilla, things like that, but those are all copyright characters, and so therefore they can't be folklore. Therefore, I don't include those in yokai, even though they may seem like yokai. One of the important things about yokai is that they are unknown and unknowable. This is their core nature. What I mean by that is that uh, yokai have exceptions to every rule. There's no Linnaean classification system. Uh, th there's no uh, rules that work for the supernatural uniformly. For example, uh, there's a rule that Japanese ghosts don't have feet, except that some Japanese ghosts do have feet. So obviously the rule has exceptions. Yokai are full of contradictions. And what I mean by that is that um, since they're folklore, there's no canonical text like there is with mythology. Uh, each village has its own version of each story and each storyteller will tell their own interpretation. So variations on the same folktale frequently contradict each other. But because it's folklore, they're all technically correct. Appreciating yokai means accepting that you have to embrace those contradictions and just enjoy them for what they are. And finally, yokai defy explanation. The more we define them, the less mysterious and wondrous they become. Uh, by explaining yokai, we actually eliminate their very nature. This might be one of the hardest things for Western readers to get used to, because in Western storytelling, there's almost always a reason or an explanation or some sort of logical underpinning to the way a ghost acts or the, what a monster is doing. Um, it's not the case in Japanese folklore. And without that explanation, sometimes it might feel like a story is unsatisfying. But in Japanese folklore, you have to learn to be comfortable with the fact that uh, by definition, since yokai are impossible to understand, often there just is no explanation. And that's part of the joy of yokai. So now let's move into the talk about cataloging yokai organizing them into uh, understandable chunks. I just want to give a very, very brief history of yokai studies before we move on to the cataloging itself. Um, these are some of the big names in yokai studies. They're not the only names, but they're some very important people. The first one is Toriyama Sekian. He was an Edo period artist. Uh, he created a series of yokai encyclopedias that were modeled after uh, Chinese nature encyclopedias. Uh, they had an illustration of a yokai and then a story or a poem or some information about it. And these were not new to the people of Edo at the time, but 
it was sort of the first way to see them in this encyclopedic form. So he's one of the first people to put yokai in these large catalog books. Later on, Inoue Enbyo uh, was a 19th century scholar and professor. Uh, he was raised as a Buddhist priest, but later on he became a professor who was interested in debunking superstition by using skepticism. Uh, he really was interested in yokai, but he thought it was strange that we attributed all of these um, natural and scientific things to creatures that we didn't even know existed. So he spent a lot of time trying to debunk superstitions. Then a little bit later, we have uh, Yanagita Kunio, who is known as the father of modern Japanese folklore studies. If you're interested in Japanese folklore, you may have read his very famous book, The Legends of Tono, or Tales from Tono, depending on the translation. Um, he started preserving rural Japan's folk tales uh, just to try to keep them from disappearing. And he is one of the most influential people in that field of study. A little bit later on came Mizuki Shigeru, whose name you might have heard of. Uh, he's the artist who made yokai a household word. Uh, he created the, the comic series Gegege no Kitaro. Uh, he also wrote a number of encyclopedias about yokai and, and did a lot of research and cataloging of yokai and collecting them and preserving them for future generations. Uh, he is the reason that yokai is known, or yokai are known by everybody in Japan. Uh, Everyone here grew up with Gegege no Kitaro and grew up knowing at least something about yokai thanks to Mizuki Shigeru. So he really took them out of the academic sphere and made them into a pop culture thing. And more recently, uh, Professor Komatsu Kazuhiko, who is over at the International Research Center for Japanese Studies in Kyoto. Uh, and he is the creator of the online Kai database, which is um, a, an online accessible database that catalogs yokai, preserving them and organizing them by location and by themes. Um, and he's sort of digitizing yokai and bringing them into the 21st century and making them accessible to people via the internet. So he's doing very important work as well. So let's talk about some of the ways that we can catalog yokai. One way is catalog categorizing them by geography. And that includes by describing the places that they live, sort of like we do with animals. Um, yokai of the mountains, yokai of rivers, lakes, oceans, shores, fields, temples, cities, castles, etc. Talking about them where they where they live. So let's just look at a few examples. Uh, mountain yokai. This one is uh, Ipon Datara. He only comes out once per year on December twentieth. He jumps around on his big one foot and he flattens anybody who happens to be in the mountain that day. So in areas where Ipondatara lives, people are warned, do not go into the mountains on December 20th. Here's an example of some river yokai. These are kawa otoko, which means uh, river boys. They are um, tall, dark-skinned, friendly yokai who basically like to sit by the riverside and tell stories. Uh, they don't hurt people. They're quite nice, very shy. Lake yokai are often dragons or snakes or other kinds of creatures that serve as the god of the lake. They're very powerful. This is one example. Her name is Ohatsu. She's the dragon who lives in Akamatsu Pond in Totori Prefecture. Uh, she grants wishes to people and she overlooks the villages nearby and makes sure they get enough rainfall. Uh, many times lovers will visit her shrine to pray for success in their romance. Ocean yokai, uh, for example, this one called Bitan, which is from Okinawa Prefecture. Uh, Bitan is this magical cow-like fish and there's a legend that if you see a bitan, it will cure your headache. So the people who live in the area near where bitan lives are said to have no headaches because they always have them cured by this creature. Kagewani is a yokai that lurks around the shores of Shimane Prefecture and other coastal areas of Japan. Its name means uh, shadow shark, and this 
this uh, large fish lurks underneath the water and if it sees a boat, it will swim up to it and it will eat the shadows of the people on the boat. And if a kagewane eats your shadow, you vanish. So it's kind of a scary creature. Here in the fields, we can see this yokai named Kijikui. Uh, his name means pheasant eater, and that's what he does. He runs away from humans, he's very shy, but he feeds primarily on pheasants, which are the national bird of Japan. There are a lot of yokai in temples, and I like this one a lot. It's a fox named Hakuzosu. And you may be familiar with the idea that uh, in Japan, foxes can change their shape and take on human form. Well, this fox ate a human priest. He gobbled him up. The priest was named Hakuzosu. So the fox ate him, and then he put on his clothes and disguised himself as the priest. And then for many years, he just lived as the priest, doing his temple chores. Uh, his story has a sad ending, though. He went to a horse race one day, and a couple of the dogs at the horse race could smell that he was a fox. So they leaped on him and tore him to bits and he died. In cities, we have all sorts of different yokai. These two ugly folk are called Nikurashi and Jumen. And their names are sort of word plays or puns. Both of them mean ugly. And that's basically what these yokai are. This is a yokai who haunted Inawashiro Castle in Fukushima Pre Prefecture. Her name is Kamehime. Uh, and she kind of viewed herself as the, the actual ruler of the castle. So the lord of Inawashiro Castle actually served at her pleasure, even though she rarely made any appearances. There are yokai inside of your body as well. Before diseases were really well understood in Japan, people thought that sickness was caused by yokai. So these three creatures are called subaku. They're examples of yokai tapeworms. They swim about inside of your body and they chew on your internal organs, which causes you great abdominal pain. And of course, there are yokai who don't live on earth either. There are yokai who live in the underworld and in other planes of existence. Uh, these two creatures are gozu, which means cow head, and mezu, which means horse head. And they are big demons who are sort of the jail guards of, of hell. Their job is to abuse the souls in hell and to make sure that nobody escapes. Okay, another way of categorizing yokai is by era. We can look at Japan's history and break it into certain time categories and if we look at the yokai that were popular during those times, there are specific themes about them. For example, in the ancient times before uh, recorded history in Japan, uh, there were a lot of yokai who were the demonifications of tribal leaders or political enemies. This was a period when Japan was really trying to centralize authority in one location. There were a lot of different tribes located all over Japan. So the central authority would send warriors out to go subjugate these tribes. And oftentimes the stories of those wars uh, turned into yokai stories. This one here is called Akuru. And this is a giant sea monster who was slain by the prince Yamato Takeru. However, it's also thought that it may have been a metaphor for a war that was waged against a tribe of seafarers who opposed the central government. During the Heian period, <clears throat> aristocratic nobility was the center of Japanese culture. And so the Heian era yokai are often the ghosts of nobles and aristocrats who take revenge against people who wronged them while they were alive. Political intrigue and scheming was a big part of arist aristocratic life, uh, but this also continued on in death. So the Heian period elite were terrified that the ghosts of their rivals would come back for them. During the Middle Age, uh, the popular yokai reflect the rise of warrior culture and the political instability of the time. Uh, and yokai from this era are usually depicted as powerful evil monsters who can only be slain by virtuous samurai. Uh, the one pictured here is called Itsumade, 
and this one attacked the capital during a terrible plague, and it was slain by an expert samurai archer named Hiroari. Then during the Edo period, Japan had a long time of peace and prosperity and growth. Uh, and because of that, a very uh, centralized urban culture developed in Edo, uh, the capital. And also literacy boomed. So there were a lot of printing presses and uh, Japan had a very high literacy rate. And so there was demand for books. So authors collected yokai stories from around the country and they would sell them in cheap printed books for everybody to enjoy. This is the period where uh, Toriyama Sekian, who I mentioned earlier, published his yokai encyclopedias. New yokai were also invented, uh, catering to the urban lifestyle that was popular in Japan at the time. They were no longer just scary stories or heroic fantasies. They also became humorous and satirical. Yokai that mocked religion and priests became popular, as well as yokai stories about prostitutes and brothels, which were a major part of Edo's urban culture. The character pictured here is called Jigoku Tayu, which means the hell courtesan. She was a very high class prostitute with unparalleled beauty and a brilliant mind to match. Uh, she wore a kimono that was decorated with scenes of hell, which is how she got her nickname. And then the post-war period, we see a lot of creation of, uh, well, urban legends, but they're effectively the same thing as yokai. Uh, they're created by groups of people and nobody owns them. So the 20th century yokai are often the ghosts and monsters that haunt institutions like public schools, toilets, highways, train stations, even online forums. The one pictured here is called Teke Teke. Uh, she is a woman who was cut in half when she was run over by a train and her torso can run faster than a speeding car. She chases people down by running on her hands, which makes the sound teke, 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 and it's how she gets her name. Uh, when she catches you, she will cut you in half and steal your legs. So she's pretty scary. Okay, and finally, categorizing yokai by similarity. This is the biggest category that I have in the presentation. And this is the one that I like to use. I break yokai down into four separate categories, which includes oni, onryo, kaibutsu, and kai. There is a lot of subcategories, but we'll just leave it at these four for the moment. Talking about oni first, it's often translated as demons. There's a few different types of oni. The first one is wicked people whose sin transforms them. So these were originally human beings who uh, committed crimes or did terrible deeds. And while they're alive, they transform into horribly powerful demons. Another type of oni are humans who are changed into demons by strong emotions like love or hate. They don't necessarily do something bad, but their powerful passion causes them to transform. The character pictured here is called Kiyohime, and she was a young girl who fell in love with a priest, and she loved him too strongly that when she, when, when he couldn't return his affections, her affections because he was a priest, she transformed into this massive fire-breathing snake demon, and she chased him down and ended up breathing fire on him and roasting him alive. After that, she was so sad that she threw herself into a river and drowned. Another type of oni are the evil spirits of the dead who come back to haunt people. Uh, the one here is called Itsuki. Itsuki are the souls of people who hanged themselves. Now there's a rule in hell that when one person dies, one soul gets to reincarnate, but you can only be in reincarnated when somebody dies in the exact same way that you died. So these spirits who hanged themselves wander around the world and try to coerce people into hanging themselves so that they can move up their position in the reincarnation queue. So they're pretty nasty spirits. They'll try to make you kill yourself. And finally, there are Oni who live in hell and work in hell as the servants of hell. Their job is to punish people, torture them, abuse people, and assist the, uh, the bureaucracy of hell with judging all of these dead souls coming in.
Another type is onryo. And these are the ghosts of Japan. Uh, specifically, it means vengeful ghosts. So these are ghosts that come back to actually harm people. The most common onryo are the souls of people who died feeling strong emotion. Uh, these are very similar to Western ghosts as well. The example pictured here is a man named Kohada Koheiji. He was an actor who was famous for playing the role of a ghost in kabuki plays. He was murdered by his wife's lover. In death, he used all of his acting skills to become the scariest ghost he could, and he haunted his wife and his murderer until he drove them mad. Another type of ghost are the wandering spirits of living people. You don't have to be dead to become an ongo. If your emotions are strong enough, they can manifest as a ghost even when you're alive. An ikiryo is a living ghost that looks like you and haunts people for you while you're asleep or while you're away. Another type of onryo are the dead nobility manifesting as vengeful gods. I mentioned these earlier talking about Heian period yokai. Ancient nobility who were forced out of their position or betrayed by scheming politicians would often come back as powerful godlike ghosts called tatarigami. They would inflict curses on people such as plagues, famines, floods, droughts, uh, earthquakes, and tsunamis. These are some of the most terrifying yokai in Japan. And a lot of Japan's festivals, such as the Gion Matsuri in Kyoto, actually originated as religious festivals meant to appease these tatarigami by enshrining them as gods so they would be worshipped and honored rather than feared as ghosts. And finally, onyo are not necessarily restricted to humans. Uh, animals could also become onyo. The yokai pictured here is called supon no yure, which means the ghost of a soft shell turtle. And this yokai is the collection of souls of countless soft shell turtles coming together to form one big ghost. They haunt the restaurants that serve soft shell turtles, and they specifically target the customers who have eaten way too many turtles. Next is kaibutsu or monsters. And this is by far the largest and broadest category of yokai. It contains uh, the whole range of strangeness that we see in Japanese folklore. It has a lot of subgroups. And the first one is shape-changing animals. Uh, you may be familiar with the idea that kitsune or foxes or tanuki or other animals can change forms and play pranks on people. So uh, kitsune are one example of these. It includes divine messengers. These are spirits that are sent by the gods to deliver important messages to humanity. This one here is called Yogen no Tori. This is a two-headed bird who appeared in Ishikawa Prefecture in 1857. It told observers that a deadly pandemic was coming, but those who viewed the Yogen no Tori would be spared from death. So it instructed the observers to copy its image and print it in newspapers so that it would, it would spread far and wide and protect the population against the pandemic. There are also transformed people, uh, people who have turned into yokai. This one is named Bekataro. He was born a human and he had a very, very insatiable appetite. At an early age, he would start eating everything and he would never stop. Pretty soon he began eating garbage and objects too, but it still didn't sate his hunger. So finally he decided he would try eating people too. Uh, so he just committed so much sin by eating human beings that he transformed into a yokai that looked like this. Yokai also include, or kaibutsu also includes uh, sukumogami, which are objects come to life. The idea is that ordinary household objects can develop a soul if they're not taken care of for too long. The example here is an oi no bakemono. Uh, it's a backpack, which has transformed into this fire-breathing bird-like monster. Sometimes emotions are caused by yokai. This spirit here is called buruburu. And what it does is it possesses a human being and it causes them to shake. The Japanese sound for shaking is buruburu. 
So this yokai is named for the sound of shaking. Basically, this yokai makes you feel like a coward, makes you feel fear all the time. And there are a large number of fantastic beasts. A lot of them are chimerical beasts, uh, creatures that have the body of one animal and the head of another and the legs of another. Uh, some of them are just uh, strange creatures altogether, but uh, this one is called a rokugyo, and it seems to be part fish, part cow, and maybe part dragon. And there are lots of other uh, types of yokai in this kaibutsu category. I don't have time to go into all of them today. Um, this is Tsunamura no Bakemono. He was a pumpkin ghost who was spotted in Edo in the 19th century. So skipping over the rest of the kaibutsu because there's just too many of them. Uh, we'll move into the fourth category, kai-i. This means phenomena. And this includes yokai that are not physical creatures. For example, phantom sounds. There's an effect called tengu daoshi. It means knocked down by a tengu. And this is a sound that is heard deep in the woods, especially by woodcutters. At nighttime, they would hide in, they would sleep in these little wooden cottages, but they would hear all sounds of terrifying noises out in the woods. Sometimes it sounded like trees were being knocked down and, and falling over, even though it was too dark to be chopping wood. So that was blamed on Tengu blowing the trees down with powerful winds. Yuri lights were also a very common sight. This is called Chochimbi. These are mysterious orbs of light which appear on the edges of rice paddies at night. Hakanohi means graveyard fire or grave fire. And this is a mysterious fire that was seen at graveyards. Um, people would say it looked like uh, smoke and fire were coming up out of the tombs themselves. Curses and enchantments also fall under this, this category. Um, the example pictured here is called a wara ningyo. It's a straw, a straw doll. And these were likenesses of people created using straw and usually a, a bit of hair or a fingernail or some, some piece of the person in question. And you would go into a shrine late at night and you would nail it into a holy tree and that would cause this person to be cursed. And also unexplainable illnesses were blamed on yokai. Um, before germs and diseases were understood, uh, it was thought that epidemics were caused by evil spirits roaming about breathing poisonous air on people. The creature here is korori. Uh, it's sort of a combination of a tiger, a wolf, and a, and a tanuki. And korori were believed to emerge from the dead bodies of people who died from cholera. And then they would run into a neighboring house and then breathe uh, cholera breath on the people in that house. And by doing this, running from house to house, they could infect an entire village with a contagious disease. So these are the, uh, the ways that I like to use to categorize yokai. Again, it's not complete uh, since yokai are unknowable. Uh, it's almost like it's a futile effort to try to know them in this way, but the temptation is there to, to attempt to categorize them. So now I'd like to uh, get onto the last part of the presentation and tell you just a few very short yokai stories. Uh, these are some stories that I like a lot. So they're very, very short and they don't necessarily make sense. But remember what I said earlier that embracing the unknowable feature about them is what makes yokai enjoyable. The first character is Niwatori no So. His name means chicken monk. This story is from Ehon Yokai Kidan, a collection of short yokai stories uh, that were illustrated. Normally, monks are not supposed to eat meat. Killing and eating animals is considered a sin, and monks are supposed to be vegetarian. Well, Niwatori no So was a monk that stole a chicken from a neighbor's yard and ate it. His neighbor noticed one day that one of his chickens was missing. 
So he went next door and he questioned the monk. But the monk grew outraged. He pointed at his shaved head and he pointed at his monk's robes and he yelled at his neighbor that no monk would ever stoop to something like stealing, let alone eating a chicken. That was a sin. Then he proceeded to lecture his neighbor about compassion and charity. But while he spoke, suddenly from his throat came a loud, Bokak! and an instant later, a chicken's head erupted from his mouth and a feathery tail sprouted from his back. The monk transformed into a chicken monster, exposing his crime. The end. So I like this story because uh, it's nonsensical and the yokai doesn't necessarily do much more than appear, but it's used to uh, illustrate the sinful monk's behavior. And this is an example of uh, yokai stories that were popular during the Edo period that satirized religion and satirized monks, especially monks who didn't exactly practice what they preach. Here's another yokai called Nasubaba. Nasubaba means eggplant hag. And you can see why she got her name because of the illustration. Uh, her, her skin is purple like an eggplant and she is an old woman. So she is Nasubaba. Her story comes from Mount Hiei in Shiga Pre Prefecture. Mount Hiei is a holy mountain in Shiga that is home to the, uh, to the large monastery complex Enryakuji. It's a very big monastery that has a lot of Japanese history. Uh, it was very, very important. So Nasubaba was once a human woman. She was a high ranking noble who lived hundreds of years ago and she served in the imperial court. However, due to some crime she committed, her soul was damned to go to hell after she died. Some say that she killed an animal and ate its meat. Others say that she committed a murder but for the remainder of her life, she repented her sins. She asked the Buddhas and the priests of Enryakuji temple to forgive her. Therefore, when she died, her spirit remained on Mount Hiei. Ever since then, her spirit has warned the temple when disaster strikes. The most famous example was in 1571. The warlord Oda Nobunaga attacked Enryakuji and he set fire to the temple complex, burning it to the ground. The fleeing monks reported seeing a disheveled old woman through the flames, ringing the temple's bell to alert everybody to the danger. That woman was Nasubaba. So even though she's kind of scary looking, she is actually a good yokai. And my final story is a yokai called Shunobon. Uh, Shunobon here. Uh, as you can see, has a terrifying face. He comes from a book called Shokoku Hyaku Monogatari, which was a collection of, uh, of stories collected from all over the country, illustrated and placed into a book. This one comes from Aizu, which is uh, in Eastern Japan. Long ago, a young samurai was traveling alone through Aizu. He heard that a monster haunted this road so he became afraid when evening fell. Not far ahead, he spotted another samurai walking in the same direction. He quickened his pace to catch up so he wouldn't have to walk alone. The two men chatted about this and that until finally they arrived on the subject of the monster. I've heard that a creature called Shunobon appears on this road at night. Have you heard this legend? Asked the young samurai. The other one turned to him and said, does he look something like this? His skin became red as blood. His hair grew into spikes and his eyes glowed like stars. His mouth split from ear to ear, revealing a row of razor sharp fangs. The young samurai was so frightened that he fainted right in the road. Sometime later, he awoke. The monster was nowhere to be seen. The young samurai ran away as fast as he could, stopping at the first house he saw. When the woman who lived there saw the terror in the poor man's eyes, she invited him inside. As he settled down, he told the woman about his horrible encounter. The woman consoled him. You poor thing, what a horrible sight to see alone on the road. 
By the way, did the monster look something like this? Her face transformed into the Shinobon he had seen earlier. The samurai ran screaming from the house. He ran all the way back to his own home and hid in his bed. He was too scared to leave. After 100 days, he succumbed to his fear and died. The end. So I really like this story for a number of reasons, but um, it's, it may sound familiar to you from uh, Lafcadio Hearn's story, Mujina, which has a similar situation where a, where a person wipes his face away and uh, turns into a yokai. And then he goes to another location and the person he meets there wipes his face and turns into a yokai. So this is a common pattern. But what I like most about this is that uh, the victim doesn't die instantly. It takes him 100 days to succumb to his fear before he finally dies. And that to me is just terrifying. Uh, if he had died instantly from fright, well, it, it wouldn't have been such a terror at all. It would have been quick and painless. But having to hide in your bed for 100 days before the fear finally kills you is a special kind of terror, I think. So I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Um, if you want to learn more about yokai, or if you want to see more illustrations and, and learn a bit more about the creatures that I spoke about, uh, you can visit yokai.com. You can also find my books on Amazon, and you can ask your local bookstore to order them for you if they don't have them there. Uh, you can also find me on Patreon or matthewmeyer.net, and those links are also available on yokai.com. Uh, all three of my books are uh, yokai encyclopedias that contain stories like we just heard today, as well as my fourth book, The Fox's Wedding, which is not out yet, but should be out very, very soon. So uh, thank you so much for listening. And I think we've got some time for questions and answers now. So I'd love to hear if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was amazing. And there are a lot of comments um, flying through the chat about how wonderful these illustrations are and where can they find the illustrations. So, you know, we've been putting in that you can find these illustrations on um, yokai.com on, on Matthew's amazing yokai database and all of these books um, are illustrated books um, and uh, encyclopedias themselves. Is that how you describe them, Matthew, as encyclopedias? Yeah, illustrated encyclopedias. Yeah. Um, so do check them out because they're quite amazing. Um, we had one uh, really interesting question um, that uh, was way back in the chat. So I'm going to extract that myself. And it was, um, if you could tell us, are there yokai that are borrowed from foreign folklore, like trolls or sirens or um, leshen, for example? So yes, that's a great question. And there are lots and lots of yokai that are borrowed from uh, foreign folklore. Uh, the largest amount come from China and India, just because uh, there's a lot of cultural diffusion between uh, East Asian countries. Um, but even the tradition of cataloging yokai in encyclopedias uh, comes from China. China has created encyclopedias of the natural and supernatural world for thousands of years. And so a lot of the Japanese authors who did that during the Middle Ages and the Edo period were copying what they saw in Chinese encyclopedias. Um, but just to give you a few examples, um, some characters that are well known in Japan, such as uh, the Kirin. Uh, you may know it from Kirin beer. Um, you've probably seen it if you're any, at all familiar with Japanese folklore, but this does have origins in China. Um, dragons, of course, have origins in China, uh, and even foxes. Um, there are native Japanese fox stories and there are Chinese Japanese fox stories and the Chinese ones were imported and kind of fused with the native Japanese fox stories to create uh, a new type of folklore for foxes in Japan. Um, nothing that was imported from foreign countries into Japan remained the same as what it was in the original country. Um, part of the research that I did for the book of the Hakutaku was to trace a lot of the movement from foreign yokai into Japan and see how they changed along the way. And I was wondering what the farthest, uh, most foreign origin yokai I could find was. And the most foreign origin I did find came from Zanzibar in Africa. 
And that is a tree called Nimenju, which is a tree that bears fruit with human faces on it. You can find it on yokai.com. Um, and these faces can talk. And that story actually uh, originated in Persia, where a, where a myth happened that uh, when Alexander the Great conquered Persia in ancient Greece, he traveled down to Zanzibar and found this tree that where human beings grew on the branches. And so that myth had existed for a very, very long time. And just through cultural diffusion, uh, it traveled up through Persia, through Afghanistan, through China, and then into Japan, changing along the way in each country, mixing with the local superstitions until finally it reached Japan and became the Nimenju. But I, I just think it's fantastic that these, uh, you know, African and Greek and, and Islamic stories all have their place in Japanese folklore. That is amazing. I didn't realize that that particular yokai actually came from Africa. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool how how distant these things are. We we tend to think of Japan as a very isolated and closed off island country, but uh, the reality is there was a lot of uh, cultural transmission. It's just it's often hidden under these layers of Japanese culture that have uh, been placed upon it. Okay, so another question um, we had was whether killing animals is a sin for uh, people other than monks. Um, yes, but it was um, more looked upon as a necessary sin. Um, killing animals is not good. Killing anything is not good because in Buddhism, uh, they believe in reincarnation. So um, the idea is that any living creature could have been a human in a past life and in theory could have been your own mother in a past life. So killing any living creature is almost like killing your own mother or committing some horrible sin. So everybody was discouraged from killing animals. Um, however, it was also understood that it was necessary to do so for people to survive. Uh, therefore, um, killing was sort of uh, okay, except for monks who, who had to practice a much more strict form of that law. Thank you. Um, we have um, a comment from Nathan Sharp, who is an indie game developer, and um, he says that working on a game about yokai, um, he wants you to know that your books and website have been an invaluable uh, research tool. So um, he thanks you for your work with that. That's Thank exciting. You, Nathan. Uh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that they've been helpful for you. Um, my goal is to share yokai with people and, and just get them out there as much as possible. So I'm glad they've been helpful. They've been really helpful to me too, I have to say. <laughs> um, another I'm question, glad. do people still report seeing or experiencing uh, yokai today? Uh, they do. Um, it's a little bit different, I think, today than it would have been a couple hundred years ago. But I've met lots of people who swear that they've seen Kappa or, or Tengu or even uh, Kitsune doing things. And I think more of what we see today is um, urban legends, which I think are, are the modern equivalent of yokai. Um, no doubt you guys have, some of you at least, have, have heard of characters like um, Hachishak-sama or uh, Hanako of the toilets, or uh, I mentioned Teke Teke earlier in the talk. Uh, there are also a lot of schoolyard yokai, uh, Yoji no Baba. Um, I can't remember them all off the top of my head right now, but there are, there are a lot of these uh, scary school stories that stick with people and uh, plenty of people have said they've seen them. Uh, plenty of people say that they see ghosts, things like that. So uh, the idea of uh, seeing yokai is definitely alive and well. Great. Um, another question is, why are Tanuki and Kitsune popular yokai um, that are seen at shrines? Do they embody something particularly important to Japanese religion? Mm. Um, well, I think one of the reasons is, of course, that everyone loves animals. And Kitsune and Tanuki are very cute animals. So that's part of their popularity. Um, 
Kitsune specifically do have a religious connection. Um, they are uh, strongly associated with the Shinto god Inari. Uh, Inari is a god of business and agriculture, farming, uh, a, a large number of things, but Inari is a very, very important god in Japan. And um, Kitsune are the messengers of Inari. And there's actually a really interesting historical reason for this. Um, long, long ago, before there were calendars, before there were writing or anything like that, um, farmers did not necessarily know when the best time to plant their rice was. But in the early spring, the foxes would come down from the mountains and into the fields. And that was a signal to people that it was now time to start planting your fields. And so they viewed this, you know, the natural migration of the foxes as a message from the gods of agriculture that it was now time to begin planting. So because of this, foxes became associated with the gods of agriculture, Inari, and that connection has just grown stronger and stronger over time. So that's one of the root reasons that foxes are, are popular at Inari shrines. Tanuki, on the other hand, you don't really see at shrines and temples. Uh, They're more popular um, just as decorative objects in front of stores. Um, so you'll see a lot of Tanuki statues, but they don't have a religious significance. Okay, we have um, a bunch of new questions. So um, one is, did the newer yokai that have been rising from urban legends, such as a kamano or red cape uh, originating from older yokai forms? And will these newer yokai be included into these yokai categories? Mm. And will you feature some of these newer ones in future books? <laughs> I do feature um, urban legend yokai in some of my books. I, I have, I think, one or two in each of my books. Um, it's a little tricky because with, with the newest of the urban legends, you have to be careful that it's not actually something that somebody wrote and because you don't want to you know plagiarize their work you have to be confident that it is a um actually an urban legend that cannot be traced to a single person or a single incident so um it, it can be a little bit tricky just as an author to try to incorporate those as for their origins they definitely share patterns with edo period and older yokai i don't know that any of them are directly the ancestors of them in, insofar as they are a reimagined or reinterpreted version of an older yokai, but they share a lot of the same um, cultural roots. So they also share a lot of the same scary patterns. Great, okay, another question. Have you yourself ever experienced a yokai phenomenon while you're living in Japan? Um, I haven't, I mean, I've certainly experienced um, strange sounds or, you know, I've seen mysterious things that I can't really explain, but um, I'm, I'm much more of a skeptical person by nature, so I, I don't actually attribute anything like that to, to spirits or supernatural things, but I, I, don't, I don't have any experiences that I would say were caused by yokai, but I can definitely understand uh, the desire to, uh, to attribute things that you don't understand to yokai. Definitely. Okay, we have another uh, question from uh, another young fan. What's your favorite, uh, your personal favorite yokai? Uh, my favorite yokai is called Aoandong. Uh, you can find her in the Night Parade of 100 Demons. She's also up on yokai.com. Um, Aoandong is this um, blue skinned, Oni, who wears a white burial kimono. And she appears after you've told a lot of ghost stories. During the Edo period, there was a very popular tradition to gather your friends together and tell 100 ghost stories. This was called Hyaku Monogatari Kai Dan Kai. Everybody would take turns telling a story. And after each story, you would blow out one candle. So you started with 100 candles, and one by one, you would tell a story and blow them out. Well, legend has it that after you blow out the 100th candle, a real yokai would appear. This yokai would materialize out of the combined fear of all of the participants in the game. So because people were afraid of this real yokai coming true, traditionally, the game stopped after the 99th story. 
So they would stop there and never allow this yokai to come into existence. Therefore, nobody really knows what Aoandon does because nobody has actually seen her. But that one really speaks to me. It, it kind of reminds me of childhood games like saying Bloody Mary in front of the mirror at midnight, stuff like that, trying to summon a real ghost. But also, I think one of the reasons I like it so much is that it speaks to the true nature of yokai. Um, yokai are the embodiment of human fear itself and human emotion itself. Uh, the, the yokai scholar Inoue Enryo uh, said that if we could see the true form of yokai, it would be the human heart. And I really like that quote. Um, you know, it, it, it's significant that yokai don't tell us anything about the world. Yokai tell us everything about ourselves. They, they illuminate our fears and our desires. And so they're sort of a mirror of the human spirit. Thank you. Um, we have a question from um, not quite the youngest fan, but um, someone who wants to hear more about the toilet um, yokai. Oh, I'm boy. I'm glad this question came up because you did go over that, and I'm sure that left people wondering. Well, there are multiple toilet yokai. Um, some of them are 20th century yokai, like uh, Hanako san, who supposedly lives in school toilets. And she will come up out of the toilet and uh, harass you or kill you, depending on the version of the story. Another famous uh, schoolyard toilet yokai is called Akamanto, who uh, sneaks into the bathroom while you are using it and asks you from the next stall if you want red paper or blue paper. And depending on your answer, she will kill you in a different way. Uh, sometimes uh, strangling you or sometimes drowning you in the toilet. It depends on the version because these are urban legends. They, uh, they take on many different forms. But toilet yokai go way, way back, even into the Edo period and older. Um, there is a toilet yokai called Kainade. There's another one called um, Kurote, I think. And these are usually uh, creatures that hide in the toilet itself you know, back then they, they sort of had outhouse style toilets where it was just a hole in the ground underneath of your room. So the, uh, the yokai would hide in this hole. And when you were squatting over the toilet to use it, it would reach up and grab you or sometimes just caress your rear end in a very uncomfortable way. Uh, so these were sort of amusing and disturbing stories that were quite popular during the Edo period. That is disturbing. <laughs> um, question from Nicholas Ice. Is it safe to say the transformation of a human to Oni is actually psychological dysfunctions? I hear in present songs, a lot of people consider themselves demons. Maybe they're not too far off. Well, it's true that um, before the idea of psychology was common in Japan, um, any sort of mental illness or disturbance was attributed to yokai. Um, so if somebody had epilepsy, for example, people would say that they were possessed by a fox or some other spirit, and that was causing it. Um, so the idea of a person transforming into an oni, I think may have, uh, there may be potentially some connection to mental illness in that, um, but because we only have the the only story, we only have this fantastic story left. We don't have any historical documentation of what actually happened. It's impossible for us to say what actually uh, inspired the story. But there's definitely truth to the idea that um, mental illness and things like that were, were blamed on yokai. So there is a comment. Um... Shirime, okay, yeah. Um, Shirime is definitely uh, a yokai that seems to exist for the lols. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so those of you who don't know, Shirime is a yokai that has, uh, well, it approaches you on a dark night wearing uh, body covering clothing. And when you, when you get close to it, it drops its clothing and turns around and flashes its rear end at you. And uh, right in between the, the cheeks, there is a glowing eye. 
Oh, so yes. Uh, oh, I know that one. Yes, that yes, is it's a, a good one. Popular and very disturbing yokai. Um, and it definitely is as silly as it sounds. I don't think there's any deeper meaning to that. Um, Edo period humor, you know, they they really enjoyed their their lowbrow, dirty humor. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, sexual yokai. There's a lot of uh, scatological yokai. And there's a lot of just, um, you know, low class humor yokai. So Shirime is a perfect example of just a yokai that was invented fully to entertain. That's a good one. It was worth the search. Um, we <laughs> probably have time for just a few more questions. Um, one is, are there yokai specific to Mount Fuji um, or Aokigara? And um, this is, uh, Krista says, I'm a writer and I find the prospect of searching through all 500 plus yokai on the site uh, to find particularly, uh, for, to, to find particular ones a little daunting. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, it can be daunting. Um, I mean, the only thing I can say is there's a search feature, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a lot of yokai and and it's sort of an endless bucket. So, um, so is there one that yeah. might be specific to Mount Fuji? As far as um, Mount Fuji, I don't. Nothing comes to mind immediately. There, there may be that I'm just not thinking of at the moment, but. Um, it's certainly not a place that is full of yokai. And I think part of the reason of that is that Mount Fuji is a very, very sacred mountain. It's the most sacred mountain in Japan. And yokai tend to be um, separated from, from the realm of the sacred. It's not always the case. For example, we talked about foxes uh, being related to the gods and foxes are certainly uh, a big part of yokai culture. But um, Mount Fuji itself, as far as I can tell you off the top of my head without looking deeper into it. I, I can't think of any yokai related to it. As far and, as Aokigahara, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna bring that up. Okay, yeah, as far as Aokigahara goes, um, that's more of a, a modern phenomenon, the, the suicide forest. Um, so yokai that would have been connected to, you know, older times don't really, I don't, I don't know of any yokai about that, um, however, there are certainly ghost stories connected to it and what you could call, you know, modern day yokai or, or, or urban legends are, are certainly connected to that. Um, and the idea of abandoning people in the woods or going off into the woods to die definitely goes back um, hundreds and hundreds of years. So there are other yokai not specifically related to, to that forest, but um, yokai that are born from people who carried family members out into the woods to abandon them to death in order that in order to not have to feed them during times of famine for example wow okay well i think that i've reached um kind of the end of the chat there's a few more questions if people um have additional questions starting now <laughs> If you want to unmute and ask Matthew your questions yourself, please feel free to do so. Well, Matthew, one question I saw that I had too is somebody asked, how did you get interested in yokai? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, that's a common question. Um, I got into yokai when I first came to Japan and started looking into what the traditional ghosts and monsters were. I've always had a strong interest in, in folklore and monsters and ghosts and, and horror and things like that um, ever since I was a little kid. Um, when I came to Japan, I wanted to know what the local stuff was because everywhere I travel, it's always fun to go see, uh, you know, who is the local creature here? Uh, you know, you learn about the Jersey Devil, you learn about the Wendigo, you learn about the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. So in Japan, I wondered what they had here. And when I started looking into that, um, I discovered the world of yokai and, and realized just how expansive it was. Um, it, it was bigger than anything I had ever seen in any other country that I had looked at. And so that was my the first time I'd learned about yokai. And it, it just has been so interesting to me uh, to see how deep this rabbit hole goes. And that's how it's kept me interested in yokai. I have a question. Oh, pardon. pardon. Um, okay, great. Are there actually hunters or people who look for them actively for proof? I see. Yeah. Um, 
it's not a big thing uh, to go looking for yokai. Th doing things like um, ghost hunting is popular in Japan today, but yokai hunting, not so much. However, there is, uh, it's not too long ago that it was pretty popular. I think it just rides on pop cultural trends. For example, during the, um, I think the 70s, there were a lot of sightings of a yokai called um, Tsuchinoko. And that's like a little snake-like creature about this big. Uh, and this, this weird snake, uh, snake yokai, I guess, was said that it, it could roll from head to tail very strangely, and it could roll down hills and attack people. And this, uh, this Tsuchinoko was featured on the news and it became a, a massive pop culture sensation. And so there were massive Tsuchinoko hunts all across Japan and um, money rewards were offered for people who could provide photographic evidence of this creature or, or a dead body or something like that. So it's not something that's really uh, far separated from history. Even in, in the 20th century, people did go on yokai hunts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. I have a question. So I've heard that there is a like a yokai master test that you can take, and it seems kind of hokey. And I was wondering if it's, is it still extant? Does it exist and does it mean anything? Or is it just kind of for fun? I do know what you're talking about. Um, I believe it might be um, either Matsue City in Shimane Prefecture, or it might be Sakai Minato City in uh, um, in Totori Prefecture that, that gives the yokai test. Um, both of those have connections. Matsue is the, um, is the hometown of Lafkari Hearn in Japan, and um, Sakai Minato is the hometown of Mizuki Shigeru. So both of those are big yokai cities. And one of them did give a, I do think it was a, like a prefecturally sanctioned yokai test. And I remember seeing on the news maybe uh, 10 years ago about the youngest girl to ever get a perfect score on the yokai test and be awarded the rank of yokai master. Um, it's been a long time since I've heard of that test, but um, I, I would imagine they're still doing it. Um, yokai have only gotten more popular over the past 10 years, 20 years. Uh, there's an ongoing yokai boom overseas and in Japan. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if they're still capitalizing on that. But as far as if it's anything um, official, I mean, I think it might be, it might be officially recognized by the prefecture or the city, I'm not sure, but it is definitely just a, a for fun thing, I think. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for your question. Um, I'd like to ask, um, I, as a game developer, I'm categorized online by uh, mostly type of environment and also um, like power level, of, you know, as enemy yokais. So uh, any suggestions you'd have there? It's hard. I, I would say power level is a hard thing to do because most yokai were not invented with the idea of um, necessarily fighting or being defeated by humans. There are a lot that are. For example, Oni are featured strongly in samurai tales about people who go off and kill them. And um, there are a lot of stories about people slaying dragons or giant spiders and, and other giant monsters, especially uh, as I discussed in the historical section during the, during the Middle Ages when Japan was ruled by uh, the Kamakura Shogunate and military cu culture was a very big part of everyday life in Japan. But when you get to the, the Edo period yokai, where the, the largest collection of yokai is invented, um, so many of them are just about entertaining people. And I think the vast majority of yokai um, are probably just impossible to really designate a power level that, that is uh, um, supported by folklore. I mean, certainly as a game developer, you're going to have to figure that out and uh, decide this yokai has this ability and that ability and can do this and that. But yeah, um, yeah there's nothing in folklore that really um, 
is helpful for, for determining that sort of thing. I, I think that's one of the areas where you just need to use your own imagination. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, using a lot of um, artistic license when I'm... Yeah, of yeah, course. Probably, and and yeah. you're, you know, I, I think that's something that's great about yokai is that because they are folklore, we all have that, that right, you know, yeah. everyone in history at some point made up their own version of each of those yokai, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just passing the baton on to modern day people to continue doing that. Awesome. Thanks so much. It's sort of like a tradition of being creative with these yokai and creating yokai. And um, Nathan, you'll have to keep in touch with us about that game that you're yeah, developing. Cause it sounds really <laughs> yes. cool and it sounds like yeah, it'll be it. a lot of fun to play for us awesome. yokai fans. <laughs> cool. Okay, um, I think that might um, wrap it up. Um, this has been so much fun and, and so interesting and really a treat, um, Matthew, to be able to view um, you know, your illustrations up close and have you um, narrate as you're going through them. That's been really wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to make a comment about some of these um, similar themes that we see in these different yokai stories like you know with the the chicken monk reminds me of um you know this guy back here uh al bozu this is a sculpture that was created by one of our exhibit collaborators kono junya who um teaches yokai tourism design at um kyoto saga university of the arts so like another formal um, education program around yokai, but um, as uh, Kono had um, explained to us about this uh, big blue monk monster, um, his background is also a corrupt monk. So as you were talking about the chicken monk story, it made me think about um, you know this guy back here, and there's a lot of these sort of similar threads and um, themes with these other. Um, Yokai, as you had brought up about Shunabon and uh, Mujina, that was um, fun to hear. Also, that Shunabon story. Yeah, there are a lot of um, a lot of corrupt monks, especially um, in Edo period yokai. Uh, one of Toriyama Sekien's favorite topic was uh, pointing out hypocrisy among monks. So, if you go through Toriyama Sekien's books, you'll see he he created a lot of these monks that committed some kind of sin and got punished for it, or monks that loiter around places they shouldn't and end up getting turning into yokai for that. So uh, there's definitely a lot of yokai based on satirizing uh, the clergy for their hip hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, um, I mean, a lot of um, demonization and other kind of uh, satirical commentary on other political figures and outsiders or, you know, people feeling demonized. Um, these are all, I think, they're, they're really important themes, I think, you know, to consider as, as we're talking about and learning about yokai. So yes, thank you definitely. for bringing all of this up and thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's here uh, watching. Um, again, uh, please check out um, Matthew's yokai.com database. Um, it's a really wonderful resource and it's also uh, very enjoyable. It's delightful um, just scrolling through and exploring that website because of his amazing illustrations. Um, and if you are someone who prefers, you know, a tangible book, uh, consider purchasing one of those uh, illustrated encyclopedias because they are, they are beautiful. Um, but again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you and guys thank for coming you, in. Thank okay. you for having me. Good night.